So by now, we are past the initial planning phase of the audit, but we're still in the overall pre-audit phase. So we haven't moved into actually testing the account yet. Now we're going to start talking about the risk assessment of the company. So why is risk assessment so important? We perform risk assessment to figure out what are the more risky areas of the company. That way, when we actually perform the audit procedures, we know which areas to focus on because we don't have unlimited resources. So we can't test everything. We need to figure out where our focus is going to be. I like to think of the metaphor of uh, a doctor, a surgeon that is going to operate on somebody and imagine that they don't even have any kind of consultation with them before the surgery. So they assume that they're just going to operate on everything. They're going to replace their legs, their arms. They don't know what to focus on because they haven't actually done this assessment. So in the same way for an audit, we're thinking about how can we assess the company's risk to know which areas to operate on, which areas to actually audit and to focus on. So a very important area of risk assessment is called the audit risk formula. Audit risk is the risk that no one detects misstatements in the financial statements, so they end up actually being on the financial statements. So the company doesn't detect them, the auditors don't detect them, so we actually have a misstatement on the final financial statements. Because after all, as the auditors, we provide reasonable assurance, not absolute assurance. So audit risk equals the inherent risk times the control risk times the detection risk. Inherent risk times control risk times detection risk. So inherent risk is uh, the risk that is inherent based on the specific account that we are testing. So certain parts of a company are going to be more risky than others. So for example, with cash, there's a high risk that people could steal cash. There's the chance that the company could overreport its cash. So based on the inherent nature of cash, it's going to be a high inherent risk. Think about prepaid expenses. There's not much that can go wrong with prepaid expenses. There's really no reason to fraudulently report them. So they're going to have a low inherent risk. So inherent risk is based on the nature of the account that we are testing. Then we have control risk. Control risk is the chance that the company's internal controls do not detect a misstatement. So imagine uh, this example here. Imagine that we are a restaurant and we provide different items on our menu. We provide some items that are more complicated, like um, a medium well steak, and we provide other items that are very straightforward, like uh, french fries. So french fries would be a low inherent risk of messing them up, and the medium well steak would be a high inherent risk. So then the control risk is the chance that we as the restaurant don't detect whenever we mess up an order. So imagine that we have a control for the head chef to then check the orders before we send them out to the customers. So the better they check the orders, the more likely they are to detect an error. So in the same way, control risk is when a company, their accounting system is going to detect the different misstatements that occur within their accounts. So control risk is the company detecting the errors. So then what happens if they don't detect the errors? That's when we get to detection risk, which is the risk that the auditors do not detect the errors. So imagine that the auditors do all this test work, but they just don't find a certain error. So that's the chance that auditors don't detect the error. So in the example of the restaurant, certain menu items have different inherent risks, and then the restaurant has different controls like the head chef checking the orders. So then imagine that once the head chef checks the orders, we then send it out to deliver to somebody. So then we might have our delivery driver, the external party, like the external auditor, actually checking the order a second time. So if the restaurant missed something, if the company missed something, then the external party might detect it as well. That way it doesn't actually get to the final customer and have any errors. So in the same way, detection risk is the risk that the external auditors do not detect the errors. Now, the interesting thing about the audit risk formula is that you have inherent risk times control risk is risk of material misstatement. This is what the company is in control of. And then we have detection risk, which is the only area that the auditors can actually control. So we can't control the inherent risk or control risk, but we can control the detection risk. So as risk of material misstatement increases, we need detection risk to decrease. So they're going to operate in an inverse way. That's the important element. So for example, if our risk of material misstatement is increasing, we need to decrease detection risk, 
by either increasing the nature of our testing or the extent of our testing or the timing of our testing. And I know that this is a very conceptual idea to try to imagine. So in my comprehensive audit review course, I provide a full animation to explain audit risk, to explain the example of the restaurant, to try to help you to understand it just a little bit better. So when it comes to assessing the risk of material misstatement, we need to assess it at two different levels. One is going to be a high level assessment and the other is going to be a more detailed level assessment. So first we need to assess the risk of material misstatement at the financial statement level. So in other words, we need to assess the different parts of the company that don't just affect one part of the company's financial statements, but rather affect the entire company as a whole. So imagine that the company changes CFOs this year. So this change is going to affect the entire financial statements as a whole. So it's going to affect the risk of material misstatement at the financial statement level. The more detailed risk assessment is going to be called the relevant assertion level. This is going to involve uh, transactions, account balances, and disclosures. Transactions are like income statement items, balances are balance sheet items, and disclosures are footnote disclosures. So we need to go in depth on what are cash risk of material misstatement. What are the risks of material misstatement for accounts receivable, for inventory, for revenue, for expenses? So as you can see, we need to do this high level risk of material misstatement and this more detailed risk of material misstatement. We're going to have two major categories of the types of tests that we perform in an audit. They're going to be tests of controls that look at the operating effectiveness of a company's controls. And they're going to be substantive procedures. So substantive procedures are any tests that are not tests of controls. So substantive procedures are going to include tests of details and substantive analytical procedures. So the full list of substantive procedures is going to include uh, confirmations, observation, reperformance, recalculation, inspecting assets, inspecting documents, and substantive analytical procedures. So out of this list, we have substantive analytical procedures, which is not a test of details, and all the other ones that I mentioned are tests of details because we're actually testing the details of transactions. We're not looking at them at a high level. We're actually going in depth to test the details of the transactions. So in terms of controls, we said that we always need to understand the internal controls, which looks at the design of the controls and the implementation of the controls. But it is optional to test the controls for their operating effectiveness. But if we do want to test them, we're going to perform tests of controls. So why would we want to test the controls? Well, going back to the audit risk formula, the control risk, if we can test the controls, then we can reduce the control risk below the maximum level. So that would bring the risk of material misstatement lower, meaning that we could bring detection risk higher. So we wouldn't have to perform as much substantive procedures if we can bring our risk of material misstatement lower. Because if we don't test the controls, we have to assess control risk at its maximum level. So we can test the controls to try to bring control risk below the maximum level. So that's the purpose of testing them to see if we can actually rely on the controls. So now we're going to talk about management assertions. This is a very conceptual idea that's kind of difficult for students to wrap their minds around. So we said that management is responsible for the preparation and fair presentation of the financial statements. So when management hands the financial statements to the auditors, they're making certain claims about the financial statements. So assertions are claims of what is true. So these assertions are going to help us to kind of break out the different claims that the company makes so that way we can test them. You could think of it kind of like a rubric whenever your professor is grading an essay. So instead of just saying this is a good essay or a bad essay, they're going to break it out into the spelling into uh, the use and the structure of the English language. So you can think of the assertions kind of like a rubric for us to audit the company. So we have different assertions. We're going to have the existence and occurrence assertion. This is more important for asset accounts. This is testing that the assets actually exist and that the income statement items actually occurred. So are these items legitimate? And then we're going to have the completeness assertion, which is asking, did the company leave anything out of the financials? So imagine that the management hands us the financials and they have left out a note payable. So then the financial statements are not complete. Then we have the classification assertion. This asks, are the items recorded in the correct account? So if management records something to fixed assets when it should have been repairs and maintenance expense, 
That would be the classification assertion. Then we have the cutoff assertion, which is, is this item recorded in the correct accounting period? So imagine that they record it in this year instead of recording it in the next year. So that's what the cutoff assertion is focused on. So next is the valuation, allocation, and accuracy assertion. This asks, is the item recorded for the correct amount? So imagine you have accounts receivable, it's recorded in the correct account, it's recorded in the correct year, but is it recorded for the correct amount? That's what this assertion is focused on. Then we have the rights and obligations assertion. This asks, do the assets actually belong to the company? Do they have the rights to the assets? And obligations is asking, does the company have the obligation to pay for these liabilities? So we're looking at the company's name to be included for the assets and liabilities. And lastly, we have understandability and presentation. This is for the footnote disclosures of the financial statements. So are the footnotes clear enough? Is the company giving enough context in the footnotes? So these are all the different assertions. Now in my comprehensive auto review course, I go more in depth on the assertions and I give a full example of a research essay to better explain the assertions. But that's about it about the assertions. Now let's talk about the concept of materiality. So we've been talking about the users of the financial statements, the investors in the company, the creditors of the company. So then let's talk about how materiality affects the users of the financial statements. The idea here is that not every error is going to be that important for the financial statements. So I think there's this common thing whenever you first start auditing a company, like you're an intern at an auditing firm, you identify maybe a $3 variance, an error that the company had, and you suddenly think that the financial statements are completely wrong, that the owners are going to go to jail, and that it's a big deal. But in reality, this is a very immaterial variance. So materiality is going to tell us what is an important variance and what is an unimportant variance. After all, we can't test 100% of the company's transactions. So instead, we need to set a certain materiality level because we're probably going to miss certain errors we're going to identify certain errors, but just because there are errors does not mean that we need to actually modify our audit opinion. So then the definition of materiality is a misstatement that would affect the decision-making of the users of the financial statements. So the auditors are going to set materiality in the very beginning planning phase. And then as they do more testing and understand the company better, they might raise materiality or lower the materiality. But how do they find the materiality? The two most common benchmarks for finding materiality is taking a percentage of the company's total assets or a percentage of their revenue. So we could say that 2% of the company's total revenue is going to be our materiality level. So any misstatements that are below this materiality level are not going to affect our audit opinion. Or we could take the total assets, or we could even take a combination of both of them. So this helps us to determine what is important and what is not important based on the size of the company. So in this video, I'm just talking about materiality at a high level. In my comprehensive audit review course, I talk about more details about materiality, such as performance materiality, tolerable misstatements, and trivial misstatements. So if you're interested in checking out free preview, you can do so below.